God, but to give you desperation right now.
grab first place or even in a tie for first place. Because nothing else belongs in first place except for Him, for His kingdom, and for His righteousness. I'm going to challenge you right now. Search your heart. Oh!
to make the decision to commit to GT. Well, if you're ready to commit to GT as a church family, the people you'll believe with and be there for come today from 1 to 3 p.m. after service in the GT. Baptisms are happening again. After an incredible service on the 28th, we had enough people decide that they also wanted to get baptized. So we're filling up the tanks again next Sunday, September 18th. If you're ready to make a commitment to Jesus and his church, sign up via QR code. The challenge is still going on. Here are current opportunities you can be a part of. Do you want to make an impact in a youth's life? Volunteer for Ripple Effect 22 Thursday nights, 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. See Pastor Stefan for more info. Today we have Adopt the Building. In partnership with San Francisco City Impact, bring love, encouragement, and relationship to some of the San Francisco's most isolated residents. You can serve today or September 25th. Sign up via the QR code on the screen. This is the church's hosting Sunday Streets Festival. It's next Sunday, 11 to 4 p.m. This is an opportunity to love and serve our community, offering physical and spiritual refreshment to our neighbors. Visit gtsm.org for upcoming events and go ahead and tap on the ministry that you are interested in and it will directly send you to the sign up form.
it's hurricane season, there's going to be hurricane disasters, well, let's pray against hurricane disasters, but in the event that there are, Convoy of Hope will be on the ground, and we will definitely be raising funds to bring relief to those areas. This is all going to fit in with today's message, and I didn't even realize how perfect it is. So hang on, because I wrestled with this. I wrestled with this. As I was preaching last Sunday, I said one phrase, and right as that phrase came out, came out of my mouth, I was like, oh my gosh, we, we need to take a whole Sunday and just unpack this one phrase. And then I immediately forgot about it because a pastor forgets everything on Monday morning that happened on Sunday because you're exhausted and either you slept too hard or you didn't sleep well enough. Anyway, you don't remember anything that happened on Sunday. So Tuesday, I was praying and the Lord reminded me of it and I was like, oh, it's, it's a little less exciting on Tuesday than it is in the middle of your message on Sunday. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't know if I really want to preach on that anymore. And so I, I forgot about it, if you know what I mean. I forgot about it. I tucked it away. And then on, and when it came to sermon prep time, I kind of was like, ah, I started working on it, but it was it was a pure act of obedience. There was no real will in me to, to prepare a message on this. And even yesterday, as I was praying on the beach, I was asking God, like, please, God, can I, can I pray about or can I preach about something else? I really want to give them something encouraging. Uh-oh. I really want to give them something. <laughs> Here's how 
good it will be if I do that. And here's how bad, it, or sorry, how good it will be if I do this. Or maybe the bad over here, the bad over here, the good, and you're weighing the goods and the bads. And I want to tell you, if you're living your life that way, when it comes to the most important decisions, you're missing out. You are missing out. Remember just a moment ago I said, there is no peace like the peace that comes from knowing that you are in the center of God's will. So if I'm looking at two choices, and this one just looks awesome, and this one just looks so-so, so I do this, that's a completely natural thing to do, right? A or B. Um, cookies and cream ice cream from salt and straw, or garlic ice cream. Sorry, Gilroy. I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? So I'm just going to do this. But if you're living your life that way on the most important decisions, I will tell you this. No matter how good this looks, when you get there, even if all the things you thought would be awesome are exactly as you thought they would be, you will not be satisfied here if it was not the will of God for your life. You'll be restless. You'll be wondering. You'll be asking. You'll always be looking to the next thing. The grass will always because you didn't ask, even though this, this decision, sorry, it's not you, but just the illustration, even though this decision looked like the, the half as good one, the so-so one, if this is where God wanted you, you will be so much more satisfied here than you would have ever been here with even things going better than you could have imagined over here, because the one piece that was missing was the most important. your heart will also be. It says you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve your 
will and God's will. You can't serve what looks good and God's highest plan for yourself. You gotta choose, I'm gonna go God's way no matter what it looks like. And I'm gonna make my most important decisions based on that. The Bible says, as a person thinks in their heart, so they are. Guard your heart above all else. As you think in your heart, as you meditate in your heart, as you desire in your heart, as you plan in your heart. In other words, it's not what you act like when you're in church. It's not the self that you put forward when you want to put on your best impression for somebody. It's not the way you portray yourself on social media. And it's not the way you do it when someone's watching. It's the kinds of things that you allow yourself to think. It's the kinds of things that you allow yourself to love and get attached to. That will determine the direction of your life. You can say in your head and in all day long, I'm a believer, I'm a believer, I love God, I love, I love Him, I'm a Christian. But what you love will determine where you go more than what you say about yourself. So be very careful. Now listen, a person with shallow understanding will think that Christianity is all about do's and don'ts. And I'm going to be, I'm just going to be honest, because if you read the Bible for yourself, you will find a whole lot of do's and don'ts. But if you really think it through, the point isn't the do's and the don'ts. The do's and the don'ts are the disciplines that you take hold of when you can't walk for yourself that help you learn to cooperate with the Spirit's work. And what the Spirit is doing is turning you into a certain kind of person. We've got little children, we're teaching them to say, please. They say, water, water. And we're like, water, please. And then they go, water, please. <laughs> we're training them to be a certain kind of person. It's not about a checkbox whether they say please or not. It's are they polite? We're teaching them how to wait patiently. Not because mm, we're forming disciplines in them and the disciplines form character. The do's and don'ts are about performance. They're about forming character. If you think that the change in the outward behavior without the change in the inward character is the point, then you've missed the point by a thousand miles. Human beings might judge by appearances, but God is looking at your heart. And He's not only concerned about your outward behavior, your outward appearance, the way that you can discipline to do yourself to do the right thing in the right situation. If you're just going to go and entertain all the stuff that you know He doesn't want you to be entertaining in your heart after putting on the good performance, that's not what He wants. I think I'm done with this. A sociopath can act like a good person better than most of us in this room. Sociopaths are the kinds of people who become mass murderers if you don't know what a sociopath is. The Bible says that God judges the secrets of our hearts. He does not judge our performance. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I hope that I have not mixed up these pages so badly that I lose my place in the next five minutes. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at what I actually, God was nudging me to preach about today, but I believe that was for somebody, so I had to take a little detour. I was prepared to leave it out. I left it at the end, but I think it was for somebody, so there it goes. What we're going to do is take a look at another well-known proverb. You know, above all else, guard the heart. You know, lean not on your own understanding. We're going to look at another well-known proverb, but this one is from the mouth of Jesus rather than the pen of Solomon. It is so familiar that most people who have been in church for any length of time at all will be able to quote the second half after I say the first half. And actually, a whole lot of people who've never been in church can probably do that too. It shows how familiar it is, but also shows the challenge of memorizing Bible verses. They are usually much easier to remember than to do. <laughs> we need to internalize the Word of God, and by that I mean memorize it. We need to do that. But listen, I would much rather have a church full of people who do God's Word but don't know it very well compared to a church full of people who have, can quote half the Bible from memory, but don't live it. 
Amen? We need to live this stuff. So we're going to see how well you do on the little test here. I'll say the first stab, you take a stab at the second. Isn't that a weird phrase, take a stab? Sounds like it has a very violent origin, but I'll say the first half, and you take a try at the second. First half goes like this. From those to whom much has been given. Hey, you got like three different versions of it. We got the ESV, the NLT, the NIV, the GTV, the... Yes, from those to whom much has been given, much will be required. Say it with me. To, from those to whom much has been given, much will be required. That's not John F. Kennedy. It's not Ronald Reagan. It's actually Jesus. But both of those guys quoted him and they, they messed up the quote. But that's okay. We got the spirit of it right. Even if the grammar was... Never mind. Let's just leave it there. So, you can tell already, illustrated here, what I said a moment ago, it's much easier to remember the Bible verse than to live it. Hmm? But if, let's memorize it, take a picture of it. So Pastor Vanessa, this is for you. She was like, hey, you said something from the pulpit about, it. hey, you should memorize this verse. Can you remember which one it is? <laughs> I hope I remember, I know the verse by heart, but I have no idea which one it is. So here it is for the week. Memorize this, Luke 24, no, 12, 48. From those to whom much has been given, acknowledging that nobody talks like this, except for English majors, given, sorry, much will be required. Let's memorize that, write it down, take a picture, whatever you have to do. So I mentioned this a while back, that in our country, our consumerist, materialist culture conspires to convince us Always to be looking at people who have more than we do. So that no matter how much we actually have, we will always think we need more. The key word there is think we need more, so we will spend more. Because spending is what drives the economy. And so no matter how much we actually have, we will always think of ourselves as not having enough, and especially not having enough compared to this person over here who I'm looking at who has more. But at least for those people who call themselves Christians, we should probably make sure that we define the word much the way that God does. Because even though we may define ourselves based on what we don't have, that's not what God is going to hold us accountable for. Not for what we didn't have compared to someone else who had more. Quiet. But don't take it from me again. Let's, let's look at the Bible to see where this proverb from Jesus comes from. This is Luke 12, 48. It comes at the end of a parable. Actually, two parables combined. A parable is a form of teaching where the teacher tells a story. The story is designed to be provocative in such a way as to draw you in. It, it piques your curiosity. Like, oh, how is the story going to end? Or, oh, what's going to happen to this person? So then you start to identify, either identify with one of the characters or another one, or you draw some kind of conclusion, usually before the end of the parable, or you make a judgment, usually before the end of the parable comes. And then often at the very end, the storyteller ends up calling you out. And say, so if you just came to this conclusion and this judgment, you just judged yourself. Because I'm actually telling this story about you, to you. You're the person I'm illustrating. Well, let's see if it works on us. This is Luke 12, chapter 12, verses 42 through 48. We're going to read it together. I think, I hope, I believe, I trust, maybe, yes. Let's read it together. Are you with me? Not yet. Okay, here we go. I'll slow down a little bit. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant thinks, hmm, my master won't be back for a while. And he begins beating the other servants, partying, and 
getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant. Because uh, what is it? Hope deferred. 
Kurt made the heart sick. <laughs> and I'm very attached. I was very attached to that guitar. Not so much now. It's attached to the wall in my office. It doesn't come down very often. So if I were to lend you my baby, my my once in a lifetime, my once one of a kind Fender Jaguar guitar, I would hope you would be very careful of it. Right? And if you if you have any respect for me at all, if you have any kind of relationship. Take very good care of it. That is what a faithful steward does. You are going to take care responsibly and carefully of, the, of something that doesn't belong to you, right? It doesn't mean it doesn't even matter if it's as valuable or as one of a kind. It's not that incredibly valuable, but it's one of a kind, which makes, which makes it valuable to me. Amen. So faithful and sensible. Why this word sensible? Why was it faithful enough? Well, if you read the story, it's pretty clear that the master is someone quite powerful. It's actually a little scary in the illustration. It says he's going to take the unfaithful servant and cut him to pieces and assign him a place outside with the wicked. So when you are accountable to someone, when you and I are accountable to someone extremely powerful, doesn't it just make sense? To do the faithful thing? To be careful of what is left in your hands? Because if you are unfaithful, the consequences are actually more frightening than being cut into pieces. They're an illustration of, they're an earthly illustration of what it means to be assigned a place outside with the unfaithful. We're going to hear that same illustration worded another way in a moment. So, let me take you over the three things that this parable reminds us of. Number one, we are stewards of a powerful master. We have to learn to identify ourselves as stewards. That is who I am. That's who I've been made to be. I'm a steward for a very powerful master. Number two, it flows from the first one, definition of a steward. Everything that we have belongs to him. It has been placed within our care. And his purpose is that in our care, the things that belong to him would become fruitful and would be used for flourishing. Where am I getting that from? Because the faithful and sensible servant is someone who manages the other servants, right? He facilitates them, or she facilitates or administrates them so that they're fruitful, so that they're productive for the master. And what's the second part? Feeds them. So I'm not just a manager, I'm a nurturer, I'm a caretaker. I'm not just going to make them work hard and have them go to bed hungry and then clap my hands or whatever, wipe my hands of them. What do you call that? I can't remember. Whatever your hands of them, brush your hands of them and say, I don't care that they're hungry, they did, they did hard work. They got the master's will done. No, I manage and I take care of them. I administrate and I nurture them. The purpose is fruitfulness and flourishing. That is God's will for his creation. Fruitfulness and flourishing. One word sums both of those up. It's life. God's purpose for everything that belongs to him is life. So we are stewards of a powerful master. Everything we have belongs to him, and its purpose is fruitfulness and flourishing. If we are responsible with what he has entrusted to us, he will entrust even more to us. If we are unfaithful, if we are selfish, if we put our own pleasure first, or if we put the pursuit of power first before the fruitfulness and the flourishing of that which belongs to him, if we put us before that, then there will be a price to pay when we are held accountable. A steward is held accountable. If you're not held accountable, you're not a steward. Because when you're a steward, what you have belongs to someone else and you're supposed to take care of it. Right? And we'll be held accountable for how we've taken care of the master's things. Now, there's one more parable that really illustrates each one of these principles. But that parable gets told in church more than these two. And they're so closely connected. I wanted to make sure we get them both in here this morning. And we're going to take a look at it right now. It's a little bit longer. And so get 
ready to read for a little bit longer. Are you ready? ready? Here we go. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his stewards and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Listen to that line right there. Remember what I said earlier, you are not held accountable for what you don't have. You are not held accountable for someone else's ability. You are only held accountable for what's been entrusted to you. And if you have it, then God has judged you able to steward it well. Hmm. Ah, I think I need to say that again. If you have it, that is evidence already that God has judged you capable, able. He's given it to you in proportion to your ability. That doesn't mean he, he, you can't have it more. But if you have it, that means God has looked at you and said, I can trust this person to handle this. I can trust them to cause it to be fruitful and to bring flourishing. Amen? Let's keep going. He then left on his trip. Verse 16. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. You are some very quiet readers this morning. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Sounds like a squirrel. Keep going. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Notice the word account. They are being held accountable because they're stewards and the money belongs to him. Let's keep reading. Verse 20. The servant to whom five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Pause right there. Notice that it's not based on how much the servant brings back. Because God gave the same praise to the one who brought back five as he did to the one who brought back two. He gives the same promise of the same reward. I will give you more just like I gave the other one more. Because you've proven that you can handle some and that means that I can trust you with more. By the way, part of how you prove is to be faithful with some first. Let's keep going. This is verse 24. Then, right in the middle of the screen, after the word together, then the servant with the one bag of silver, silver sorry, came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. Now let's pause for just a second. Have you seen anything in this story that would suggest that the master is a harsh man? No. A harsh man would say, five bags of silver, why didn't you get ten? Two bags, why didn't you bring five like the other guy did? Thought, you know, some of us had parents like that. A plus! Why don't you get an A plus plus? <laughs> right? Some of us had that kind of... Yes, I don't need to go yet. Sorry. Therapy's tomorrow. Seriously, that's not a joke. 
There's nothing in this parable to suggest that the master is harsh. Now, he may be, but I just, I'm just pointing that out. So, number, verse number 26. But the master replied, now he actually does sound harsh a little bit. You wicked and lazy servant. Either that or what, the, what this man labeled fear, he's identifying as wickedness and laziness. Maybe he wasn't actually afraid. Maybe these are, these are just excuses. Just saying. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit money in the bank? At least I would have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant, give it to the one with ten bags of silver, because to those who use well what they have been given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see why I was like, God, can I preach on anything else? Not your will, but mine. No, not my will, but yours. So yeah, those pictures of Jesus smiling with the lamb draped over his shoulders, that's only half the picture. <laughs> now, this parable shows us what faithfulness looks like. It shows us what unfaithfulness looks like, but it also shows us what faithfulness looks like. All of the same pieces are here as those first two parables we looked at, right? They're given according to their ability. They're held accountable. What they're given is not theirs. If they are faithful, if they are careful, if they steward well what does not belong to them, then they will be given more and they will be rewarded. Amen? So there's a principle here that's really easy to remember. It's actually easier than the Bible verse, but I need you to remember the Bible verse. The Bible verse is, from those to whom much has been given, much will be required. Luke 12, 48. Let's say it together. From those to whom much has been given, much will be required. Luke 12, 48. Let's say it another time. They're like they do on those 800 commercials. 1 
the most valuable thing that you have is the image of God in you. That's right, that's an identity statement. I am a steward, but I'm not a lowly steward. I am a steward who has the most valuable possession that can possibly be possessed, and that is the image of God. That is yours, he gave that to you. That is yours. You have to steward it for him, but it's yours. Now, you could say that the primary thing that this, this is getting at is your giftings. In some translations, it's the parable of the talents. Talent originally was a word that referred to a weight of money or precious metal. It, it became such a part of our understanding of how the world works that the word talent that means a gift or a skill, like, hey, uh, Grace has a talent for playing the piano. Hallelujah. Give Grace some, uh, some appreciation, some affirmation for stepping out of her comfort zone and playing the keys today. She has been given a talent. The word never had that meaning except for the word talent in the Bible. So when you think, well, I've got a talent, that is literally something that you have been given by God in accordance with this exact parable in order to bring him something fruitful in return for what he gave you. So, more gifting equals more accountability. Sorry, Grace, he gave you more gifts, you're going to be more accountable. <laughs> but more resources are limited even to our gifts and our talents. More knowledge equals more accountability. We saw this one in the first parable we looked at in Luke chapter 12. The servant who knew what the master wanted was held to a higher standard of accountability than the servant who did not know. The more you know, the more you are held accountable for. But it's not just this type of head knowledge that we're talking about. You know what another form of knowledge is? I'll tell you another form of knowledge. Here's an illustration. You get it on an airplane. The pilot's standing there. They never do that anymore after, oh wow, after September 11. The pilots don't do that anymore after September 11th, or they just kind of recently started to again. So when we were singing, in my world, be lifted high this morning, this popped into my head. In a world where God is lifted high, we won't have to have any more dates like September 11th. And you know what? We wouldn't live like September 11 is sacred in a way that we don't hold for other people who experience tragedies on that level every week, every month, every year. In Ukraine, every month, for the last six months straight, they've had a September 11. When Jen was talking about Pakistan earlier, she's married to Arthur, Arthur's from Colorado. If that flooding were here, his entire home state would be underwater, uninhabitable, nowhere to pump the water because the whole state would be underwater. September 11 is a horrible tragedy, but we are not unique in grieving violence that has been done to us. You know what's unique about us? How rarely it happens here on that scale. That's what's unique about us when you compare us to the rest of the world. The body count in Rwanda in 1994, in three months, was a million. A million people. The same thing happened, uh, Yugoslavia doesn't exist anymore. The country broke up because of the genocide that happened there. Genocides, the Uyghur people, the, the, you could just go on and on and on. This is happening every month somewhere in the world. So for September 11th this year, the 21st anniversary, could we maybe focus on the fact that all the rest of the world has one of those two? And we're not the only ones who know what it is to have loss on a horrific, unspeakable, and unimaginable scale. Amen? Amen. So, you usually, or at least you didn't used to see pilots standing in the door. If you did, let me, let me back you up because I went way off here. We're talking about knowledge. There's a kind of knowledge that's not head knowledge, and I'm illustrating what kind of knowledge that is. You get on your airplane, the pilot's there, 
and shake his hand. He's like, oh, hey, uh, you know, uh, have you ever flown a plane before? How many flights have you flown? He's like, none. But I have the flight, you know, I've got the plane schematics and the flight manual memorized. Are you going to get on that plane? No. If you go to the next terminal, or wherever you can find whatever airline has a pilot that knows what they're doing, and you're like, I'd like to go to wherever I'm going, and you get on the plane, you're like, you say to the pilot, hey, do you have the, uh, the plane schematics and the flight memori or manual memorized? And he says, no, but I've flown 10,000 hours in the cockpit. Which pilot do you want to fly with? They both have knowledge. One of them is head knowledge. The other one is experiential knowledge. Right? They're both knowledge. More experience also equals more accountability. The book of Hebrews specifically mentions that there is a greater responsibility on those whose minds and hearts have been enlightened with the knowledge of truth, who have experienced the things of heaven through an encounter with the Holy Spirit. More experience equals more accountability, especially more experiences with God. This applies all over the place. If you have more influence, you have more accountability. That should make you think twice about how fast you can get 10,000 followers or a million likes or whatever. If you have more power, you have more responsibility. If you have more authority, you have more responsibility. And you can add to this when you have had more opportunities. You have more responsibility. I can illustrate that one easily. If I walk by 20 people who are all starving and begging me for a piece of bread and I got a great big loaf of sourdough fresh out of the oven and I won't give even a bite to one of them, don't you think I'm going to be held more accountable than the person who had a tiny little slice of bread and walked by one person and wouldn't share with them? More opportunity equals more accountability. You could sum a lot of this up by saying more maturity equals more accountability. More accountability for doing the will of the master. Doing the will of the Lord. So if you really want to know how mature you are as a believer, all you have to do is read the words of the New Testament and ask yourself, how am I doing here? Actually, the chances are pretty good that you won't have to ask yourself anything. The Word itself will either affirm you in those areas that you are obedient or it will challenge you in those areas where you have some room to grow. Right? So that's part of another reason we have to read the Word. Now, the meaning of this parable could not get any more plain. I don't have to tell you what it means. I think we did that already. We can break it down with one phrase. More equals more. If you have more, you're more accountable for the more that you have. If you don't have, you're not accountable for what the person who has more has. So you can't judge your ability. You can't say, oh, I can't do anything because I don't have that. Uh-uh. God's not looking at them when he's holding you accountable. He's looking at you. And he's giving you his image. If nothing else, he's giving you his image. And you will be accountable for that. You have been given the ability to put God on display the way that no other person alive can. You've been created for that. I also think that most people in this room would say that they've been given knowledge of Him as well. Amen? You would say that you know the Father through your relationship with the Son. That is a resource that, you, that people around you need. Very quiet. People that you have been placed in their lives so that you can reveal to them what God is like. Amen. In addition to our relationship with Jesus, some have had incredible experiences with the Holy Spirit. You might have considerable knowledge of the Word of God. These are all investments in us from God. How are they functioning in our lives? Are the experiences with God just memories that we have? that we pull out when we need a testimony about who's been touched by the Lord? Is our head just full of information about the Word of God? Or are we looking to intentionally turn it into increased fruitfulness for God? And when we bear fruit, it's for the flourishing of the people that He has placed around us. The world needs some solutions.
resolutions, and you're it. Or rather, it's the presence of God, it's the image of God, it's the goodness of God, it's the character of God in you that is His intended solution for the lives of the people that He has placed around you. None of them have a solution, but you do. He's put you there. We've got to draw it. He's got to let Him draw it out of us. All of us have time. This is the word I was looking for a few weeks ago when I brought this up. Discretionary time. That means time that you can do whatever you want with me. It's leisure time. It's free time. It's time that you don't have to work to make ends meet. 500 years ago, there was no such thing as discretionary time. You had to work to make ends meet one way or another from sun up to sun down. We have a ton of discretionary time. We're going to be held accountable for it. Some have more time and some have less. I'm not trying to heap some heavy weight of condemnation on you. If you feel like you are running a rat race day in and day out and you fall down in bed exhausted every day, I'm not trying to make you feel like, like you should be carrying the rest of the world on your shoulders too. Some of us have more time. Some of us have less. We're not going to be judged about the time we don't have. We will be held accountable for the time that we do have. You know what that means? We can serve. We can serve in the church. We can serve outside of the church. Serve in the community outreaches that will give you the opportunity. Notice what we're doing. We're giving you opportunity. Remember we said more opportunity equals more accountability. Oh, you might not like this church if you want to be held accountable. Because I'm going to keep giving you opportunity after opportunity. Serve in the Tenderloin. Serve in the Fillmore. Serve in Flood. Than if we start our own little struggling thing. 
I'm not trying to compete for market share here, right? We're trying to see the kingdom of God come in San Francisco by any means necessary and with any partnership necessary. That's what Foster the City is. That's what YRAM is. That's what Ripple Effect 22 is. That's what uh, the City Impact City Academy. That's what the homeless church is. There are people out there doing awesome ministry. And I just want to help them. So we have strategic partnerships, then we have in-house initiatives. That's things that we are doing here, probably because nobody else is doing them. And that's, that's, that's not on them. That's obviously, it's a clue to what God has called us to do here. So one of our in-house in in initiatives is called Have to Give One. It's based on Luke chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, where John the Baptist is preaching to the crowds. They've been convicted, and at the end of his message, they say, so, so what should we do? What should we do? What's the application? And John says this, if you have two of something, and your neighbor has none, then give them one of yours. Essentially, I'm paraphrasing. There's a member of our community, and by community, I mean neighborhood, who was a friend of some members here who just lost everything in a fire that destroyed their apartment building on September 1st. September 1st, think about today, it's the 11th. So last Thursday was 10, 9, 8, 7. And on the 7th, they were still wearing the clothes that they ran out of that burning building in because that's all that they have to their name are those clothes. This is an example of who we should be comparing ourselves with when we think about whether we've been given much or whether we've been given little. It takes our eyes off of the people who can keep us running after more and it puts our eyes on the people who God can fill our hearts with compassion with and do unto them as we would want someone to do to us in the same situation. Amen? So what I'm asking as a church, there's one more parable, but we don't have, we don't have time for it. Uh, we do have time for it. I'll say it really fast. It's a parable of Lazarus and the rich man. There's a poor man sitting outside the gate of a man with, with resources. The poor man is starving, and he's just hungry. He says he's hungry for even one of the scraps that the dogs are eating from the master's table. But the, the, the rich man won't give Lazarus anything. They both die. Lazarus is comforted. In heaven, and the rich man is tortured in hell. It doesn't say anything about whether they had faith in Jesus. Ouch. It just says that the man who ignored the poor man on his doorstep went to hell, and the man who suffered from starvation was comforted in heaven. Now, I'm not making a doctrine here. I'm just saying. This should be sobering to us about our resources and about the people around us who have needs. So what I'm asking is as a church that we adopt this family, that we commit to them until they can get back up on their feet. We've already helped them with some starter cash. But what you and I can do to really surround this family with the support that they need is have to give one. In the same way that not one of us alone could meet that $12,000 need to feed 45 orphans for a year, three meals, three healthy meals a day, not one of us can meet that need either. To get a, to get a family from the ground up to rebuild their lives, none of us can do that on our own. But look at what we have already done together. We can do this too. And so there's a QR code for this, I believe. I'm sorry, I didn't tell them where to put it. Yeah, they're good like that. I didn't tell them where to put it. But if you scan this, you're going to get a form. And what you're going to do is you're going to think, you're going to go home, you're going to take an inventory, and you're going to just look at all the things that you have. And you should pause right there and thank God for how good he's been to you, whether it's a lot or a little. If you've got a, a, a home to go to, thank God for that. If there's nothing extra in there, then don't worry about anything else I'm saying right now. But if you have two of something, anything, that you would want one of, at least one of, 
if that was you, that your home had burned down and you had nothing but the clothes on your back, if you have two of those, put it in the form. And what we'll do is we'll let this family know everything that shows up in this form and anything they feel like they need. Please make sure it's something that you would want. <laughs> this isn't a place to go, oh, hey, I don't have to go to Salvation Army now. I mean, unless you really donate nice stuff to Salvation Army. But sometimes we have garage sales here to raise money for missions, and y'all bring stuff that, no. <laughs> Just, no. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> Give someone something that you would really want, only if you have an extra. I mean, you're not accountable for what you don't have. Amen? Amen. You hear that there's no, there's no, yeah, there's none of that on here. If you have extra, put it in this form. We'll reach out to the family. We'll say, hey, this is what the church family can do. Let us know what you want. We're not just going to drop it all off and let them then, then make them have to filter through it and figure out what they want. We're going to deliver it just what they've requested. We'll keep this going for a couple of weeks. Every, every Monday or Wednesday, we'll let them know what's on here, and we'll figure out what we can do right now. Now, they don't have anywhere to bring it right now. So... We're going to figure out how to help them get into a place, and then we're going to figure out how to help them get their lives back together through the basic things that they need to do that. Amen. <laughs> now, for some of you, doing some, okay, two, two groups. For some of you, you can't do anything, and I don't want you to feel uh, shamed about that. For others of you, giving stuff away is the easiest thing that you could do that I've challenged you with so far. Amen. So you need to give stuff away, but you also need to think about all that other stuff, your time. You need to think about your knowledge. You need to think about your experiences. You need to think about your authority, your influence, your position. You need to think about the gifts that God has given you. You need to think about all those things and hold them in your hands and say, God, these are yours. How do you want me to use them? So that I am more fruitful for you and so that there is more flourishing in the community, in the lives of the people around me. Amen? Yep. Amen. I think I'm gonna end right there. And I don't think we're gonna sing anything because I think that'll throw some of you off. Some of you are like, oh, no, 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 we're not singing anything. But some of you are like, oh, I'd rather sing and have that song release some of the tension that I'm feeling right now. But I think I want to leave you with the tension. I don't want to leave anybody with condemnation or guilt. Only the standard that the word of God is calling you to. That is the only tension, the only pressure that matters. God's standard does put a demand on us. And I don't want to do anything to ease that because that pressure will cause you to walk in obedience. Obedience will result in reward. That will also result in more responsibility being given to you, which will result in more fruitfulness and more flourishing in the lives of the people that God has placed around you and more flourishing in your own life too. God never does something through you without doing something in you and for you. Amen. So when you walk in obedience, it's not drudgery. You will always get more out of it than you put in. It's just how God is. It's how he is. It's his character. Amen. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that exactly as it says, that when John the Baptist preached and when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, that a conviction would rest on the people that are hearing this message this morning. A conviction not from me, not a weight that is based on me or my words or any kind of pressure that I can put on from my position or my authority, but a weight of conviction that can only come from the authority that is in your word and is nowhere else, that is in the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to people's hearts and from no other place. Let that conviction rest on us so that we ask you, what then should we do? And we will be obedient to what you tell us. We will do what you lay on our heart. We will test you in this and test this walk of obedience to see what the fruit is, to see what kind of flourishing you bring about through it. And we thank you, those of us who know it in
advance that that fruitfulness is going to be good. We thank you in advance that this is the kind of God that you are. That you reward those who diligently seek you. And that you reward those who are faithful when you have entrusted to us. We thank you that you are that kind of God. And for those who haven't found that out yet, I pray that they would find it out this week, today, sometime in the near future as a response to obeying what you have. You're causing to rest on their heart through your word and through your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that is with us and dwells within us, which guides us and empowers us and speaks to us. We thank you for that. And we thank you that the gift of life, we thank you for the gift of life that you have given us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. I, I have to do this. I have to do this. This is an informality. I do want to make sure that you get an opportunity to be prayed for today because I have no idea what kind of burdens you walked in here with. So I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward. It doesn't matter how small or big the thing that you need prayer for. God cares about your smallest problem and nothing is too big to be impossible for him. Amen. Amen. So prayer teams coming forward, please come and receive prayer if you need it. Give God a chance to show himself powerful and loving in your circumstances. Amen. God bless you.